blessed each and every one of you is to having a blessed day. As far as announcements are concerned, I want to make you aware that now that we have gone past the shelter in place, our Governor Abbott has uh, allowed us to be able to start to have church again, and there's certain phases that are going to be involved, and I just want you to know that your leadership team is also trying to figure out what's the best laid plan. One of the things that was suggested from the governor's office is that we would actually have church more for the senior adults, those that are 65 and older, uh, that uh, maybe aren't always as quite as technologically advanced as some of our younger people are. And so what your leadership team has been talking about is having a church service for those that are 65 and older, and we would actually start that on next Sunday, which will be Mother's Day. And it would be good to see some of you ladies being here and being able to, to honor you uh, on Mother's Day. We, there are some things that we're going to have to do in order to make sure that the church is ready, uh, that uh, you will find when you get here that, that we would have everything in place uh, for us to be as safe as possible. It's even being suggested that um, people were, would wear masks and, and gloves, uh, those type of things, in order to make sure that, that everybody feels comfortable. But I'm looking forward to it, us being able to get together again. But we definitely still want to be very cautious about how we do things. And so I trust that uh, many of you uh, will choose to come and be a part of our service uh, next Sunday. And I'm just looking forward to being able to see a lot of you again. It'll be a, a definitely a blessing uh, for us to be able to do so. So uh, be in prayer for this and uh, just uh, un be especially in prayer for your leadership team. We want to make sure that we follow all the guidelines that the state ha is suggesting. And uh, so be in prayer for them as they get together to try to help make sure that all those guidelines are being met. Mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healing set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healing set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Dancing. It's foolishness I know, but when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love.
Grace, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of worship and song. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the way that these songs are able to speak to our hearts and speak to our minds and reminds us that, uh, well, you loved us first. And as we take a look at today's scripture, Heavenly Father, we were reminded that uh, you loved Peter so much, you were willing to not only restore him, but to reinstate Him. And so, Heavenly Father, we're asking that You would do the same thing for us. If there are those of us that need restoration, that You would help us to be restored into Your likeness, into the image of Your Son. But if there are those that need to be reinstated because maybe they have fallen from grace, we just ask, Heavenly Father, that You would do the same for them as well. So we just ask for your anointing to be upon this time, be upon your word in particular as well. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to take a look at John chapter 21. This is going to be a follow-up from last week. Last week, uh, you know, we took a look at at the fact that uh, Jesus had appeared for the third time to his disciples. And when he did so, they had been out fishing. They went out to do what it was normal for them, what was natural for them. And they actually got the opportunity to enjoy having breakfast with Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but I do look forward to the day when not only do I have breakfast with Jesus, but lunch and dinner as well. And just being able to spend the all of eternity with my Savior and my God. But uh, I trust that you feel the same way about it. But Today we're going to take a look at what ends up happening after breakfast is over. And so, in John chapter 21, we're going to begin reading in verse 15, and we will read till the end of the chapter. So, John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. 
Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your arms, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This is the one who was leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testified to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Once again, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and for the opportunity that we have to spend in your word. Speak once again to our hearts and minds. Help us to be able to hear from you what it is that you want us to hear from your word. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This morning I want to talk a little bit about restoration to reinstatement. There's slight differences here that have taken place when we talk about restoration versus reinstatement. Being one that has been a part of the construction field, I, I understand what restoration is all about. In fact, I even have a good friend of mine. His wife happens to take old furniture and, and, and brings it into their house, into their garage, and she has a little shop that's set up in there, and she will fix the things that are damaged, and then she will sand it all down, and she will paint it, and she takes what looks like something that probably needs to go out and be thrown in the trash into something that is beautiful and something that people have wanted and people will actually turn around and purchase from her. And, and it's exciting to see how these things can be restored. And it's kind of the same way in the construction business. We, we have over the years, we've gone into houses that, that you can tell that they haven't been updated for quite some time. And, and they're, they're looking a little bit, um, well, is it okay if I use the word shabby? It, you know, it's just not looking real good. And yet, when we go in and we remodel things and, and bring things more up to, to current uh, looks, uh, that it, it really it transforms the whole thing. And, and restoration has taken place. What once was old has gone away, and now what is new is before you. And it looks totally different, and, and it's something to be proud of once again. And, and I see the same thing kind of happening here when it comes to Peter. I don't think it's an accident, and many of you over the years have heard me say this before, but I don't think it's an accident that Jesus asked the question three times to Peter, Do you love me? For those of us that know the backstory, we understand that what has taken place in the past was that when it came to the day of Jesus' rest, he denied Jesus three times. Jesus had predicted that. Jesus had told him, you will deny me. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. Peter, oh no, that won't happen, Lord. I'm not going to be that guy. But guess what? He was that guy. He does deny him three times. And so I don't think it's an accident in any way, shape, or form that Jesus is asking him the question, do you love me? In the beginning, as Jesus is asking the question, he's kind of helping to restore him, bring him back around to understanding what it really means to love Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? For those of us who have studied Greek, and as many of you know, I, I am not one who has studied Greek very much because, well, the first semester I ever took of it, I failed. There wasn't any need to go into Greek 2 if you don't pass Greek 1, right? But there are those that are smarter than me 
that do understand Greek. And so I have a tendency to kind of like to look in to see what the, I can't re-say the words that they use, the Greek words, but I can definitely understand their definitions when they begin to talk about it in English. And we know from, from Greek that there are actually three different words in Greek that are used for the one word that we use as love here in, in our English language. And the first one of these words is the word eros, E-R-O-S, eros, which actually is that physical love. It's that, um, it's that love that, well, we actually end up with the term erotic that comes about. It, it, it's more that touchy-feely type thing, and, and, it, and it's more of a word that many times we compare it to lust. You know, it, it, it is... It is that type of love that, that requires the physical. But then Jesus also, in, in its Greek language, uses the word philio. And that is the word that, that is used in this portion of Scripture as well. Not so much from Jesus, but, but from Peter. And, and it is more of that companionship, that uh, brotherly love type. And in fact... The, the town of Philadelphia gets its name as being the, the city of brotherly love based on this word philios. Philio is the, is the word that, that is in Greek that becomes the one, well, it's kind of more like the word like. I like you. I like you quite a bit. I like you a lot, enough that I would consider us to have a brotherly love and connection for one another. But then there is this word agape. Agape love is that kind of love that is unconditional. It, it's, it's self-sacrificing. It, it, it's a love that says, I'm going to be completely devoted to you. And this is the question that Jesus is asking. Do you agape me? Are you going to be totally devoted to you? In, in some of the Greek interpretations, we actually see where when Peter responds, he responds with, well, yes, Lord, you know I feel off you. I'm, I'm all about this filio. I understand what you're talking about here because I have this brotherly love for you. And Jesus is trying to reinstate him. One of the things that I find that's interesting, though, about this portion of Scripture is that when you look back at the beginning, as we look back at the verses we looked at last week, the first 14 verses, you see that Peter has gotten the rest of the gang to go out and go fishing. This is something that Jesus asked them in the very beginning. If you want to be my follower, I will make you no longer be a fisherman of fish, but I will make you a fisherman of men. You will become fishers of of men. It, it was, it's an evangelistic type approach. It, it's one of those where, hey, you're no longer going to have to, to go out and fish for these things that are going to make money and income for you, but now you're going to go out and you're going to fish for man, and you're going to actually make a difference in people's lives as being fishers of men. And, and so it's more evangelistic that you have to go out and you have to try. It's just like going fishing. You have to go out and do something. You either drop the net, you got to drop the hook, whatever it is. And we're seeing here in this portion of Scripture where we have moved from this idea of evangelism to this idea of of discipleship. What does it mean to become a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple of the Messiah? It, it, it is, is it kind of change in the thinking process how they are no longer going to be the ones who are going to go out and say, hey, why don't you come in and be a part and hear what Jesus is teaching? Instead, they're going to go out and they're going to be, be start to say, this is what Jesus has been teaching. We've got the news. We've got the good news. It's, a, it's ready. It's available just for you. So Jesus begins to ask the questions to move them from being the fishermen to becoming shepherds. It's a different profession. It's something that's a little bit different. I mean, the flock is already being there. It's already there uh, at, because they've been out fishing. And, and now that the flock is there, what are you going to do with that flock? We're moving from fishermen to shepherding. 
And so Jesus asked the question, Do you love me? And of course we all understand. Peter says, well, yes, I love you. You know that I love you. And so then he turns around and he asks, and he says, well, if you love me, so to speak, feed my lambs. And, and in other words, what I think that, that uh, Jesus is trying to say is that I've got a plan for you, and I want you to, to take care of the young believers. I, I want you to make sure that the, these young believers understand who I am, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a part of the fold, what it means to continue to look towards the future as being a believer that has been restored by Jesus. And so, the, the, Peter is, well, okay, I can handle that. I, I, I think Peter was all in favor. And, but then Jesus turns around and he asks the second time, Peter, do you love me? And, and, and I'm sure Peter at this point in time is going, well, yeah, you know, that, that's fine. I, I understand that, yes, I do love you. There, there's no doubt in my mind. There shouldn't be any doubt in your mind. But, but, you know, Jesus has asked him the second time. So he turns around and he says, yes, Lord, I do love you. And Jesus tells him to make sure and take care of his sheep. Take care of a sheep. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Take care of the sheep. Take care of my flock. I mean, this, this is something that's a little bit different. I mean, first you have to take care of the young ones. Now he's asking me to take care of my sheep. And, and it's, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, hey, not only do I want you to take care of the young ones, but those that have been around for a while, those that have been following me, those that are going to start following you, I, I need you to take care of them as well. You've got a responsibility towards them. You need to make sure that, that they are discipled and that, that not only are the lambs growing up in, in the grace and understanding of, of who God is and who, who I was as, as the one who was the ultimate sacrifice, but you also have to make sure that as they get older, they don't stray, that they understand who it is as well and who I am as well. And, and so... As time goes on, I think that Peter begins to understand that, hey, this wasn't a short-term commitment, but this was a lifelong commitment that he was having to make. Then he turns around and Jesus asks the third time, Do you love me? By this point in time, the Scripture even tells us that Peter's getting a little bit upset. He doesn't understand. Why are you asking me this three different times? Probably, in, in, and I hate to say it this way, but probably a little bit in Peter's arrogance, he probably kind of was hoping that Jesus hadn't remembered that he had denied him three times, you know. But Jesus understands. You denied me three times. I'm going to reinstate you by asking you a third time. And so as he does so, he asks him the question. And as I said, Peter gets a little bit upset and he doesn't. And, he's, and I love what Peter says because Peter turns around and says, You know everything. You already know whether I love you. And in the Greek language, he changes the word from philio to the word agape. You know that I adopt you. You know that I love you. And Jesus turns around and says very plainly, feed my sheep. In other words, he's letting Peter know that there was going to be no end to this call of discipleship that was upon his life. It didn't matter what age the sheep were becoming, Peter was there to, in service to be able to be the leader, the teacher, the pastoral care, whatever, caregiver, whatever they needed, he was to be there and do so. See, Jesus knew that he needed Peter to continue to teach, no matter whether they were young, no matter whether they had just been following for a short period of time, or whether they were lifelongers. They still needed to be fed. They still needed to be taken care of. 
no matter what group they were in. But then Jesus kind of shifts gear. I mean, just almost immediately, if you notice here in Scripture, there's a period and then Jesus kind of keeps on talking. And when He does so, He predicts the death of Peter. He reminds him that when he was younger, he had great freedom. And he could go wherever he wished. He could do whatever he wanted to with his life. But in the end, he was going to be arrested. He was going to be bound. And he was going to be carried off to an execution. Peter was going to glorify God by being the martyr that he needed to be. The one who had denied the Lord was going to lay down his life for him. The one who had said, I do not know him, is going to actually be the one who's going to die and say, I knew him and I'm not ashamed. I find it to be interesting that right after Peter has been told how his life was going to end up, Jesus says, follow me. You know, many times in our Christian walk, we have a tendency to be willing to follow Jesus as long as things are going good, as long as things are going great, as long as we're getting what it is that we think that we ought to get, then we're all about following Jesus. Yeah, I'll follow Jesus as long as He continues to do all the things I want Him to do. I'll just continue to follow Jesus. But when things get tough, like what we've been going through lately, we have a tendency not to want to be followers of Jesus. We, we have a tendency to say, well, I can do better. I can do this on my own. I don't need Jesus. I don't need to follow Jesus. But yet, what is Jesus asking us to do? Even during the tough times, even when we are unsure of what is going on, we still need to follow Jesus. You see, Peter is reinstated when Jesus asks him to follow. He, he chooses to do so. Peter has decided, yes, I will follow you. Knowing how things are going to end, I am still going to follow you. And as Peter follows Jesus, he then turns around and he looks at John who is following them. And he says, well, what about John? What about him? I mean... What, what's, what's his outcome going to be? And I so appreciate how Jesus answers because he says, what is it to you? Why does that matter to you? Is it really that important to you? But yet, too many times, I believe that failures in people's life with, with walking with Christ those who have been Christian before and they've fallen short, many times that comes about because instead of keeping their eyes focused on Jesus, instead of keeping their eyes focused on the one who was willing to give his life, we have a tendency to look at other people. And when we look around at other people, we have a tendency to think, well, what's going to happen with them? Why are they doing so much better than I am? Why is it that God has chosen to bless them and God hasn't chosen to bless me? And we begin to have all of these questions to the point that sometimes we just end up totally forgetting who Jesus is. Well, if He's not going to bless me the way He's blessed them, I don't need Jesus. Or if that person can get away with that and I can't get away with that, well, then what good is it? Why can't I, be like, why can't I do the same things that they do? And you know... We have a tendency sometimes to get so wrapped up in other people's lives, we forget to look to Jesus. You see, Jesus did not say that John was still going to be alive when he came back again, or that he was not ever going to die. What he was telling Peter was, Peter, don't worry about what is going to happen to somebody else. Take care of what I need you to take care of. Do what it is that I am asking of you. See, Jesus has forgiven Peter. He's forgiven his sins. He's washed those sins away. And so Jesus didn't rebuke him, but he has given him another chance to prove himself. One of the great things that I like about this portion of Scripture, especially in this overall chapter, chapter 21, is any point in time along the way, 
Jesus could have gotten on to the disciples for the decisions that they had made. He could have gotten on to all of them. What are you doing out fishing? I told you to go to Galilee and wait for me. But he doesn't rebuke them. (coughs) Excuse me. He doesn't get on to them. He doesn't do any of those things. Same thing with Peter. He could have just turned around and said, Well, Peter, you denied me three times back here. I told you you were going to. Now you're going to have to pay for it. And yet, that's not the way Jesus worked. Instead, Jesus turned around and said, you're welcome to come and be a part. I'm going to restore you back into the fold, and I'm going to reinstate you as a leader for the continuation of the good news. You see, it doesn't matter about Peter's past. What Jesus is trying to talk to him about, what Jesus is trying to tell him, is I am more concerned about your future. Many times we get all caught up in our past. Well, you don't know my past. Well, you don't understand what I've been through. Well, you don't understand. God can't love me. Look at all the things that I've done. But the truth of the matter is, God, once He has forgiven you of your past, is not concerned about your past. In fact, it's been my personal experience, and it's been one of those things I've seen over the years, that sometimes some of the best teachers and preachers of God's Word are those who have probably some of the most tainted past that you've ever seen. Because they better understand what God's grace is all about. See, it doesn't matter about our failures. It doesn't matter about our shortcomings. Redemption is there for each and every one of us, just like it was for Peter. See, Jesus restored Peter so that he could reinstate him as a disciple. Henry Nguyen, a great theologian, said these words, If you know you are loved of God, you can live with an enormous amount of success and an enormous amount of failure without losing your identity. Because your identity is that you are loved. The great basketball player Michael Jordan made this statement after retirement. He said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have taken the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeed. See, God doesn't stop loving us because we make mistakes. He wants to strengthen our weaknesses, forgive our sins, and move beyond our failures so that we can continue to be used for His glory. He, has, he is a merciful God, and He is a God who loves us, and He is a God who will never, ever forsake us. So like Peter, are we ready to be restored from the things that have happened in our past and allow God to cleanse those and take care of our past so that we can be reinstated into His kingdom as being a follower, one who is willing to follow Jesus no matter where He wants us to go. Are you willing to do that today? Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank You once again for Your Word. Thank You for the opportunity that we've had to spend some time in Your Word this morning. And I ask that your word would speak to our hearts and minds in a way that only you can allow to do so. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the work of the Holy Spirit, and we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to each and every one who is listening to this message to convince them beyond a shadow of doubt that everything in their life is, is the way it needs to be. But, Heavenly Father, if conviction is necessary because there are areas that they need to, well allow you to do some work, we ask that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit would be upon them as well. So, Heavenly Father, help us during this process, during this time of this pandemic, during the uncertainties of everything that's going on, help us, Heavenly Father, to recognize that we are still a child of the King, that you love us so much, and that you 
have a plan for each and every one of our lives. So help us to know beyond a shadow of doubt what your good, pleasing, and perfect will is for each and every one of our lives. For we do ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.